Last week we left off, or at least I talked about the fact that I believe <clears throat> that something greater than seeing miracles with our eyes is having the, that great miracle of the Holy Scriptures in our hands and in our hearts. I believe that's greater than any miracle that we can see is to have the Word of God in our hands and in our hearts. And I just had one last point to make on that discussion. And that is, since it is true that it is a greater miracle to have the Word of God complete in our hands and in our hearts than it is to see miracles, since that's true, that means you and I must be men and women of the Word of God. Listen to Joshua 1.8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest, listen, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success and of course most of us know Psalm 1 verses 1 through 3 blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful notice a little progression there by the way I remember years ago Charles Spurgeon's commentary on that notice walking standing sitting don't do that don't get caught up by the tricks of the devil and the desires of the world. See that? Walking. Oh, hey, what's this? Stop standing. Oh, I like this. Sit down. Get comfortable. Don't do that. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Stand in the way of sinners. Sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also not, shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And keep in mind when I mention the law, for you and me today, that includes all scripture given by inspiration of God, Genesis to Revelation. We're meditating in the word Jesus Christ said in Luke 4, 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And that includes uh, the New Testament as well as the Old. And then the last verse is 2 Timothy 2.15. They're all important. I would say this one is very important. It says, <clears throat> study. That's a command. That's not a request. Study. To show thyself approved unto God. Not You don't have to impress me. We don't have to impress each other so we can quote the Bible. So we can have all the right answers. Study to show thyself approved unto God. He's the one that's going to judge you when your life is over. Not me. Not somebody, the person sitting next to you. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. It's going to take work. It's going to take work. But if anything was ever worth work, it's the Lord and his word. That needeth not to be ashamed why would we be ashamed? Because we should have known and we could have known, but we didn't know because we didn't study and work to rightly divide the word of truth. And to rightly divide the word of truth means a few things. First of all, it means to understand one verse in the Bible in light of every other verse of the Bible. And then also to rightly divide the word of truth is also to recognize that Although God never changes, the way he deals with man does change. We call those dispensations. For instance, <clears throat> the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Whether you're a dispensationalist or not, nobody argues that we're not under the law today. We're under grace. Well, there's two dispensations right there. And then there was a time period before the law. There's three. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, the main point is since the word of God, this is the word of God. 
Wow! Isn't that exciting? Isn't that amazing that we have the Word of God? Does you does your response though? Is what does what you do with your time and your life prove that you really think it's exciting and amazing? That's the question. Are you living by every word of God? Are you taking it in regularly? Are you studying and working to know God and to know his word that you can do what it says and be prosperous and successful in your father's business? That's the question. And by the way, uh, our God, our gracious God has not only given us his living word and his written word to keep us in remembrance, he's also given us each other. He's also given us each other. Proverbs 27, 17, you know this one. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. That's one of the reasons we're here together today, to sharpen each other. So God's given us his word, but he's also given us our brothers and sisters in Christ so we can keep each other in remembrance, so we can help each other to finish the race, to fight the good fight, to finish our course, to keep the faith. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 <clears throat> This is the last verse of chapter 4, and in that passage we read about the rapture, the catching up of the saints, how the Lord is going to come for his church to take us home to be with him forever. And at the end of that passage, he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And that's another one of the reasons that we're here together today, to comfort one another with these words. So that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. That's why we're here. Second Peter, <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Peter wrote this, and as an under-shepherd of God's flock, he says this, and I'm saying it too. This is why I'm here for you. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it is me, it's fitting, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. That's why I'm here, to stir you up. I, may God help me not to be negligent, but to put you always in remembrance of these things. Though you know them, and you're established in the present truth by the grace of God, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I want to stir us up by putting us in remembrance. So we're here for each other. And lastly, you know this one, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And if we've ever seen the day approaching, it's right now. And the Bible says we should be getting together all the more to provoke one another unto love and good works and exhorting one another. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. <clears throat> okay, back to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, 13. Here we go. <clears throat> when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Knowing and believing the correct answer to this question will determine the eternal 
destiny of every soul on this planet. The Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. Neither is there salvation in any other. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Not by going to church, not by good works, not by knowing the gospel in your head, but by him, knowing him personally, truly, and intimately. John chapter 1 verse 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, to them that believe on his name. In John 17, 3, Jesus prayed, this is life eternal, that they might know thee and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. First John 5, 20. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And we all know Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They didn't lose their salvation. He said, I never knew you. This is the same one in John 10 that said, I know my sheep. Didn't he? I know my sheep. So these are not people that lost their salvation. What does he say? I never knew you. Not I knew you until you lost it. I never knew you because he knows his sheep and he's known of his sheep. And if you don't know him, you're not one of his sheep and that saving knowledge comes only through the word of God and the Holy Spirit Jesus himself said in John chapter 3 verse 5 verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born of water and the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God the water there is symbolic of the Word of God. And the, and the Spirit doesn't need an explanation. It's the Holy Spirit. The water there, like it says in Ephesians 5, remember, He gave Himself that He might sanctify and cleanse it through the washing of water by the Word. The Word. The Word of God. No one can be ever saved. No one can ever come to the knowledge of God, which is eternal life, except through the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit. First Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And Ephesians 1.13 and 14 says this, In whom, that is Christ, ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise praise God which is the earnest down payment of our inheritance until until you lose your salvation no listen listen the Holy Spirit, for those who receive Christ, who believe in Christ, who know Christ, he's the earnest of our inheritance until 
the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's when you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until you're glorified and with him and like him forever. So that means you never, ever lose your salvation. Question is, though, are you saved? See, that's the question. And we're going to talk about that, Lord willing. Titus 3, 4 through 7, listen to this. Isn't God good? Isn't his word alive and powerful? Titus 3, 4 through 7. After that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Hey, you could just put Jesus there. If you're right in your Bible, in your notes, Titus 3, verse 4, you could write Jesus. He is the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Why am I reading these verses? Because you can't know him. You can't have everlasting life. You can't be saved apart from the word of God and the Holy Spirit. That's why we're looking at these verses. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through, our, through Jesus Christ, our Savior that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. You say, amen, right? Amen. You say, amen. I believe that. I believe that. So my question then is this. You believe that? Do you? Does the way you think the way you speak, the way you behave, does it prove that you believe? The Bible says faith without works is dead. So here's another question for those who say they believe in Jesus. How do you know that you believe? Most people base their eternal destiny on less information than they demand when ordering a meal. They just believe that, eh, they just believe what they believe and expect if God's really real, he's going to cut me a break. After all, God is love, right? God is merciful and gracious, right? Yes. He is, but God is also holy, just, good, righteous, and he is a consuming fire. And that means that if we are to be saved, it's going to be on his terms, not ours. We can't just assume we are saved because we feel at peace or because we're happy with what we believe. There's only one God and it ain't you. And since he's God, it's his way or the hell way. So let's look at some verses with God's help. Let's look at some verses to help us as we seek to test ourselves to see if we really believe. Second Corinthians five seventeen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Those who respond to the drawing and conviction of the Holy Spirit with repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are born again and a new creature in Christ. This is a supernatural miracle which will change a person's life. Let me say that again. A person who responds to the drawing and conviction of the Holy Spirit with repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is born again as a new creature in Christ. That is a supernatural miracle which will 
change a person's life. Not only does God make us new, God himself comes to live inside of us. Wow. So, ask yourself. Ask yourself. Don't don't no need to answer me. Ask yourself. Has this really happened to me? Have I really been born again? When was I born again? Am I really a new creature? Do I really have new desires? Do I desire to know and please God? Do I live a holy life? Do I desire to be holy? Do I love the world and the things of the world? Do I deny myself certain things because I love God and I want to know him and please him? Do I desire and seek to bring others to Christ for salvation? Do I love other Christians? <clears throat> Do I desire to be with other Christians? Am I bringing forth the fruits which the Bible says will accompany the new birth? These are important questions that we need to ask ourselves today, not tomorrow, not when we die, today. 1 John chapter 2 verses 3 through 5 says this Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected Hereby know we that we are in him. It is logical and more importantly, biblical, that if we say we believe in Jesus, our lives are characterized by doing his will as revealed in his word. Let me say that again. It's logical and more importantly, biblical, that if a person says they believe in Jesus, their, li their life is characterized by doing his will as revealed in his word. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Clearly, we see in the Bible that if a person doesn't read and study the Bible, they don't love Jesus. They don't know Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. This is the teaching of the word of God. So we see that while we are not sinless, the life of the true believer is characterized by a lifestyle of obedience to God's word. <clears throat> Let me read Matthew 16, verse 13 again. Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. When he came, excuse me, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man am? The Son of Man. This is one of the many titles of our Lord in the Bible. The Son of Man. <clears throat> and it has more than one meaning. First of all, Jesus is the Messiah, which means the Anointed One. 
and he was prophesied to come into the world. Let me just read two scriptures. Psalm 2, 1 and 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Mashiach, his anointed, the Messiah. Okay, Jesus is, and you'll find in the New Testament, the, the Christ, we're going to get to that, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the equivalent Okay, the Old Testament for anointed is Mashiach, Hebrew. The New Testament Greek is Christos, I believe, which is Christ in English. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is his title. It means anointed, the anointed one. Daniel chapter 7 is what I'm going to read, verses 13 and 14, to hear about this person, the Son of Man. The Son of Man. It says in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. The Son of Man. Number two, the phrase Son of Man is used of others in the Bible, not just Jesus. Son of Man. However, when it has the definite article, when it says the Son of Man, it is almost always speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ezekiel, for example, is called Son of Man several times, but never called, to my knowledge, the Son of Man. Also, number three, all of us are sons of man because we're all physical children of Adam, the first man. Jesus is the son of man because he is the only physical descendant of Adam without a sinful nature. Mary is it Mary is a physical descendant of Adam, but the sinful nature is passed down through the man. Jesus was born of a virgin without a sinful nature. This is why, one of the reasons why he is called the second man. The second man. The first man, Adam, was created without a sinful nature. The second man is the Lord from heaven, conceived by the Holy Ghost and also without a sinful nature. The son of man. Let's read Matthew chapter 16, verse 14. It says, In response to Jesus' question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So the first answer when he asked them, Who do men say that I am? was John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Some thought that Jesus was John the Baptist. Let's see if we can figure out why. Let's hear two, three verses. First of all, Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. Now listen to Jesus in Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See that? John was a preacher. Jesus was a preacher. John came preaching, repent. Jesus came preaching, repent. The Lord Jesus, like John before him, preached. They preached repentance. And not only 
did they preach repentance. The apostles after them preached repentance. Peter did so in that that sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when he said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And not just Peter, but the other uh, apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31 preached. And he preached repentance. He said, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. He hath given assurance unto all, and that he hath raised him from the dead. <clears throat> By the way, not only did John the Baptist preach repentance, not only did Jesus preach repentance, not only did the apostles preach repentance, but you and I are to preach repentance as well. In the Great Commission, which I have found to be the most underquoted Everybody knows Matthew, go teach all nations, right? Make disciples. Everybody knows Mark, go into the uh, world, preach the gospel to every creature. Not many people can quote Luke in his account of the Great Commission. And that's found in Luke 24, verses 46 and 47. Jesus said, <clears throat> Thus it is written, and thus behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So that's part of the Great Commission for us to go and preach repentance. So here's a question for you. Would you like to be like John the Apostles and Jesus? If the answer is yes, then preach repentance. Preach repentance. And that is that men must turn in their hearts and their lives away from sin and unto God. That's what it means to repent, to turn away really from everything to God, to turn in your heart and in your life to God. First Thessalonians one, nine and 10. says ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come also Ezekiel chapter 18 I'm going to read the second half of verse 30 to verse 32 God says thus saith the Lord God Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Listen to God. Listen to God pleading with men. God's not willing that any should perish. He wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so he cries out and almost begs and says, please repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so your iniquity shall not be your ruin cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed why will you die O house of Israel I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth saith the Lord God wherefore turn and live ye All right, back to more reasons. More reasons why the people, when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they said, John the Baptist. Here's some more reasons for you before we move on. Matthew 3, 7 through 10. When, the, when, when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And say, think not to say to, within yourselves, 
We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now listen to Jesus in Matthew seven nineteen. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. We're starting to see a pattern. Why? They said Jesus was John the Baptist. Some people thought that because he sounds just like him. His message is very similar in a lot of ways. And uh, a good reminder is that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And nobody was more filled than the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that they both preach repentance. And they preach too. <laughs> and how about Matthew 12, 33 and 34? Jesus said, just like John before him, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He sounds just like John. So, not only did John the Baptist and then the Lord Jesus Christ after him preach repentance. They both lived holy lives. Listen. They both lived holy lives so that they were in a position to point out hypocrisy with boldness. You hear that? They, they didn't just preach repentance. They didn't just preach and call people vipers. Okay. They lived holy lives and thereby were in a position by living a holy life to point out hypocrisy with boldness. So I am not telling you to go around calling people snakes. I'm not telling you to do that. What I am telling you is this. If you want to preach boldly like John and the Lord Jesus, you're going to have to live a holy life filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what I am telling you. Matthew 7, 5. Jesus said, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Acts 4.31 Listen to this. Talking about the early church. <clears throat> it says, When they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. You see that? First of all, they prayed. Not just privately, but corporately. They prayed. And as a result of those prayers, they were all filled with with the Holy Ghost. And as a result of the filling of the Holy Ghost, they all spake the word of God with boldness. I'm sure more reasons could be found as to why men thought Jesus was John, but that's enough. I think you can do some more study if you want. In the meantime, let's be holy. Let's live holy lives. And by the grace of God, Let's preach boldly repentance like the Lord Jesus. Amen.